Mullen Training Coordinator for Wisconsin FACET. On behalf of our entire Wisconsin FACET staff, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar is entitled Providing Additional Supports for Students with Mental Health Challenges in the Schools. Our presenters today are Anna Moffitt and Yu Davis. Anna Moffitt is currently serving in the position of Family Ombudsman for the Madison Metropolitan School District. In her role, she works directly with families by providing resources, support, and information to improve their child's experience in the Madison School District. She formerly served as the Executive Director of NAMI Dane County, a, peer, a parent peer specialist with Wisconsin Family Ties, Madison School Board member, and an elementary educator. She has also done extensive advocacy work in the disability community and has a son on the autism spectrum. Yu Davis is the father of four children who have mental health needs. His personal experiences led him to leave his business career behind and join Wisconsin Family Ties, a statewide family-run organization serving families that include children with social, emotional, behavioral, or mental health challenges. With Wisconsin Family Ties, he has worked diligently to enhance public understanding of children with mental health needs and their families. Mr. Davis has chaired multiple state level mental health committees and is the founder of the National Association of Family Run Organizations. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce to you both Anna and you. There you go. Thank guys. you. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Hugh, did you want to add anything? No, I think uh, Bonnie covered everything that I could say. All right, excellent. Well, thank you all for joining us today. I can't see anybody because I am in charge of the PowerPoint, but I really appreciate everyone being here today. And so let's move forward. We have quite a bit of content um, in this presentation, and, and, and a lot of the content is really there for you to look back on and reflect on when you, you have time. So let's get started. So today, the different things that we want to cover is just some current data in regards to children and youth mental health, although it is from the 29, it is from a 2019 survey, so it is a bit outdated, but I, I still think it's relevant. Um, really an overview of some more common mental health conditions that present in children and youth. And that those slides I really wanted to include just so that you could look back on. So we'll move through those fairly quickly, as well as how they might present in a school setting. And then we'll also talk about a variety of treatment modalities that are available and um, then in the community and then also school school based supports that may be available depending on uh, what school system your child resides in. I personally am going to be focusing on the Madison Metropolitan School District because I work in the district and I'm more familiar what they provide, but many of these um, uh, school-based supports are uh, national, nationwide, and, and they may be available and being utilized within your school district as well. And then we'll also cover some community-based resources for families. Hugh, did you want to add anything? Uh, nothing to add on this slide, thanks. Great. So as we move forward, just to review some current data, like I said, this, this is coming from the 2019 Wisconsin Youth Risk Behavior Survey, and I've linked that to the PowerPoint so you can look at it more deeply. I really just pulled some of the data um, around mental health from it, but it, it, it contains other data points as well. Nationally, we know that one in five individuals will be diagnosed with a mental health condition, so it is fairly common within our community. Um, right now, we are seeing fairly high rates of mental health needs within our children and youth. So 49% of students reported experiencing anxiety, almost 30% reported experiencing depression, 16% of students considered suicide. And I think what's really pertinent for today's discussion is that over 80% of children with a mental health condition will go untreated. And in fact, data shows it takes about 10 years for the onset of a mental health condition or a mental illness prior to treatment. And about 75% of that treatment, treatment for children and youth will be administered at school. So it's really important as staff and caregivers and family members to know what is available 
within your school district, as well as what's available within the community around you. I think another data point that I didn't include on this slide was really around the, the onset of a mental illness is typically 50% will present by the age 14 and 75% of the mental illnesses or mental health conditions will present 75% by 25 years old. So I think historically we thought of this as something as a condition that only adults experience and live with, but what we know is that it presents itself much earlier and just to be aware of that and, and know the signs. And then I would also add with this slide that this is general information across the board, but when we look more specifically at different demographic groups like LGBTQ+, BIPOC community, and um, children and youth uh, living in poverty, that the incidents are higher than what we would see for um, our, more, our white middle class children and youth. Hugh, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll just add uh, that um, one additional stat that's I, I think relevant, although it's not specific to mental health, is the um, seclusion and restraint data that uh, DPI is now publishing. And uh, what it shows is um, that there's roughly around 20,000 incidents of seclusion or restraint in our schools each year. And uh, right around 80% of the students that are affected are students with disabilities. Um, so it's a, a, obviously an, an issue that uh, needs more attention, um, from, in my opinion. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Hugh, too. And I think if we looked even deeper into that data, we would see that the students with disabilities that are being um, secluded and restrained tend to fall under the educational labels of emotional behavioral disorder and as well as autism spectrum disorder, which are both categories that you would find in DSM-5. So, like I said at the onset, we're going to talk briefly about some of the more common um, conditions that we see being diagnosed within children and youth in regards to mental, mental health. Um, and those would be generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, depressive disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, and eating disorders. And so we'll look at these a little bit more closely, but we won't spend too much time. This is just more information for you down the road. So looking first, um, we looking at the data, we do see a, a high number of students that experience anxiety or at least and say that they're experiencing anxiety. And we also see that there's a high number of kids that are diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. So really, what are the different uh, ways that an anxiety disorder may manifest and what it might look like in school? So folks know that it's, it's chronic and excessive worry or anxiety, and it's really about things that wouldn't necessarily be anxiety producing, or it might be anxiety producing, but not to the, to the extent where you would alter your lifestyle. And so when we see that ex excessive worry, these are kids that who, who may have trouble getting to school. There might be high levels of truancy. They might be avoiding school because there are things happening there, um, whether that's academic expectations, interpersonal relationships, any number of things. Also to some, what is also related to anxiety is there can be a difficulty on focus as well as a pretty significant impact on short-term memory ability. And a lot of folks don't know that, but when you're experiencing a high level of anxiety, it does uh, make it more difficult to retain the information that you might already have in your mind. So that can, we could see that on performance anxiety, so difficulty on its assignments or tests. Um, and then also too, it can manifest in perfectionism, really always trying to be the best. And anxiety can also result in sleeping problems, as well as other somatic problems like headaches, stomach aches, or other bodily pains. And so that can really lead to, again, avoidance, less of an interest, in academics, extracurriculars, and also to a lot of time in the nurse's office or just out in the hallways avoiding um, whatever might be the trigger. Hugh, did you wanna add anything?
I can't see you, Hugh. So oh, I. Sorry, I shook my head and you can't see me. <laughs> no. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Thanks. All right. Great. And so another um, disorder that we're seeing, and we'll probably see a little bit more of because of what has happened as a result of the ongoing pandemic, is post traumatic stress disorder. And so, really, when we're talking about PTSD, some of the signs might be that there's a really heightened awareness of things going around people, hypervigilance. There can also lead to negative thinking patterns or people just really fearing failure and not really having a high self-esteem. There can also be really um, strong and emotional responses to different things that may trigger that individual to think back to that traumatic event that you might not necessarily understand or be aware of. And then it can also be just an avoidance of certain people, places, or other things that remind them of that trauma. And so, again, what it might look at look like at school is really that child or youth that really has a really hard time um, being able to focus their attention on tasks or whatever the discussion is. It also might present in somebody really not being willing to try things new things or things that they think are going to be too difficult because they don't want to fail or not be successful. And then it can also be a child that goes into a place where there might be some really significant um, verbal or phys physical dysregulation because of the trigger that presented itself in that situation. And so sometimes we might see that for kids that are unwilling to walk into the lunchroom or they uh, come across an adult that they don't know and, and, and just shut down and can't, can't communicate with them. So those might be signs that you would see in the school setting. Anything else, Hugh? Uh, no. All right, this is you. All right, this is just a fair warning that uh, we're gonna talk about some difficult subjects on the next slide, so. Uh, um, prepare or uh, look away or turn off the volume for, for a minute. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Yeah. So depressive disorders, and uh, you can read the slide. I'm not gonna read it for you. Um, uh, what uh, depressive or depression may look like in school. I think there's a couple of additional things that aren't on this slide that uh, are important to note. Um, one is that depression doesn't uh, necessarily manifest itself in chronic sadness. Uh, it can come up, it can look like anger instead of sadness. Um, and so it's sometimes difficult to identify uh, depression in kids. Um, and because of that fact, and it's often um, misdiagnosed as something else. Um, and the other thing I think it's important for people to realize is that the uh, when it comes to self-harm or uh, suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, um, there's uh, evidence that a significant um, number of suicide attempts uh, are actually um, impulsive acts. And so some of these things that it talks about um, where you uh, have um, certain characteristics like talking about um, uh, harming yourself or the chronic sadness or um, things like that are difficult sometimes because um, the, the act itself can be quite impulsive. So what does that mean? Um, you know, I think for us it means that uh, when we have a child who has uh, some of these tendencies that has um, that you're concerned about um, their views of themselves and, and their role in this world, uh, that we do something called means restriction. So means restriction just means that the, uh, we take care to protect our kids from the more lethal uh, methods of harming themselves. So um, guns, either removing guns from a home or ensuring that they're uh, locked in a gun safe and that um, no one has access to it except a parent, um, things of that nature. Um, one thing that the research does show 
that uh, is, is a really common factor though is listed in here and that it's a um, change in sleeping patterns. Um, a, a fairly uh, significant change in sleeping patterns generally occurs uh, prior to um, uh, these acts of self-harm or, or suicide attempts. Next uh, slide, unless you have something to add, Anna. No, thank you for sharing that, Hugh. I and definitely, and the things that I didn't mention earlier too is is that you're really looking at dramatic changes or significant changes in behavior, and also changes in behavior that do last over a couple of weeks or so. So I think just being mindful of changes and that changes that seem to last for a while. So um, obsessive compulsive disorder is also another um, area of diagnosis and it does fall under anxiety and anxiety disorder. And so it can be tied to anxiety. And so folks hear about this quite a bit. I mean, of course, individuals that have these thoughts that, that can't get out, that you can't get out of your head and are just there all the time. And a lot of times you'll see that in children. And, and I think we're gonna see an increase of it now thoughts about cleanly, cleanliness, like having to wash their hand or always checking silverware or cups to make sure they're clean or being afraid to go into certain spaces. I know personally for me, I'm working on it a lot with my uh, youngest daughter because they've been masking. There's a real fear not to have that mask on because of those thoughts of getting sick. And then compulsions are really just things that people do that help relieve them of those thoughts. And so that's where we see those repetitive behaviors. I think, again, going back to the hand washing, I think things that we don't think about as much at school, though, is you can, there can be children who feel like they need to uh, keep things. You know, if they find different items around the school, maybe they'll keep them in their pockets or want them in their backpack or be taking them back and forth to school. And the reason they're doing that is that does help with those thoughts or the anxiety that they're feeling. Also too, I feel like something that we don't think about all the time is kids that have a tendency to maybe steal things. You know, we have a really negative connotation around theft in schools, but you know, for some students that may be taking things, that may be because they are trying to deal with their anxiety. Another issue that I think we're gonna con continue to see an increase in, especially with social media, is body dysmorphia. So just that um, obsession about what your body looks like, what you think your body should look like, how it compares to other people. So really being aware of if a child or a youth is always worried about their appearance, are they not coming to school because they think they don't look that good that, good that day? or they just need to lose a couple of pounds. So you might see some of that avoidance and then also to really excessive use of social media and filters, um, which have really had a negative impact on children and youth. And then last, I wanted to include this one around the excessive hair pulling or picking of scabs. So the, the more, Medical terms are, you know, trictolomania and excoriation. I think it's important for people to be aware of this because this is something that you may visibly see with a student that might let you know that there's some underlying issues that are going on. So these are students that may not have eyelashes or may have some pulled out. Maybe you see different hair patches on their head. Also, too, if a, if a child has lots of opened or healed scabs, and then also just finger picking and nail biting are things too that may just say, hey, I might need to check in with this child or I might have to check in with my own child to see, are they experiencing anxiety? Are they experiencing um, other things that are leading them into these types of behaviors? Hugh, did you wanna add anything? Nope, I'm good, thanks. Okay. And I just really bring this up because while I was an educator, I did actually work with a student and um, it was one of the things that made me reach out because I, I did notice that they didn't have any eyelashes and I, I just checked in and I really found out more about some of the trauma that she was experiencing at home, which was leading to this manifestation within the school setting. Oh, hey, Anna. Yeah. 
I did think of something that I probably mm -hmm. should have. And that is that, uh, you know, sometimes with those, some of those issues, you don't really think of what kinds of accommodations should we make. Um, a number of years ago, uh, we worked with a family uh, with uh, um, a, a child who was doing this excessive hair pulling and had pulled out actually chunks of his hair. Um, his mom, in an attempt to try to keep him from being able to get a grip on it, had had his hair cut um, very close, but it exposed all of these these patches in his hair. Um, so he started wearing a hat to school. Well, the school had a rule against wearing a hat in class and kept forcing him to take that off. You know, I think yeah. that most of us as, as adults would say, that should be a reasonable accommodation. I mean, we allow um, kids who have cancer to wear head covering um, as an accommodation. And uh, while trichotillomania may not be life threatening, um, it, it, you know, it certainly is a medical condition that deserves our empathy and accommodation. Um, and so just to looking at those kinds of things and how that might, af might affect a student's participation in school um, is really important. Thanks for sharing, Hugh. I think that is, yes, completely, that should be a reasonable accommodation. And I know later in the present presentation, we'll talk about how fair does not, does not mean equal. And then the last category of um, disorders is just looking more closely at the different types of eating disorders um, that children and youth may be diagnosed with. And I think most folks are very familiar with anorexia nervosa. There's a lot of attention paid to that within the media. But I think another condition that we don't talk about as much is anorexia athletica. And that's really where um, children and youth may use um, excessive exercise to uh, burn the calories that they feel like they need to get rid of to maintain a high level of being thin. And so it's just something to be mindful for and looking at. And, you know, especially in this area where we see such a focus on athletics, just making sure that when children and youth are participating in athletics, that it, it, it stays healthy. And, you know, unfortunately, I think we do have some different areas of athletics that really don't maintain that level of mental health and physical health um, for children and youth. And just, you know, if your child is participating in that, I, I can just think offhand personally. I think we hear a lot about it in gymnastics and dance. Um, what we don't hear about as much as in boys is in wrestling, where um, individuals really have to adhere to strict dieting. That that could be something that you know is also at play with individuals that are participating in those types of sports. Um, and then I think too we also hear quite a bit about bulimia nervosa, um, and so but just being aware that it it's not just um, vomiting. You uh, individuals can also be using laxatives to get rid of it. Um, I think this is also a very, very serious condition that has very long-term impacts um, on children and youth, um, including heart conditions as, as similar to anorexia nervosa, but also um, considerable issues around um, your teeth, dental issues, as well as around um, your esophagus. And then the last one that I think is gaining more notice is just around a binge eating disorder. So really eating large amounts of foods, but not um, getting rid of them. So obviously leading to becoming overweight. And so moving on, I just wanna say before Hugh takes over, is that this information is really just for you to have for reference. We completely do not want anybody to feel like they have the ability to diagnose a child or youth with a mental illness, but these are just some things that you could be looking for. And it's really, if you see something, the most important thing to do is to say something and start that conversation. All right, Hugh, go ahead. All right, thanks, Anna. Um, so while Anna said that those um, previous slides are ones that you can use for reference, a little bit more detailed information, 
you know, it's, it's a little hard to access all of that information um, on, a, on a moment's notice. And so what we tried to do is uh, kind of pare it down to what are some of the common things that we see. So just a, a much shorter list across a wide variety of mental health uh, challenges or diagnoses. And so this is that list. Um, you know, it's around the area of being able to focus or attend, um, inability to regulate emotions, at times seem, seems like the child can't control their own behavior, they're inflexible, um, might manifest itself in the inability to share something with others or the inability to negotiate. Um, around communication, uh, so being able to have appropriate and reciprocal social uh, interactions with other kids, with peers, or with adults, although um, adults tend to be much more forgiving in their conversation with students. Mm -hmm. So adults sometimes don't uh, recognize this in kids as much because unless they're observing uh, peer interactions because the interaction with an adult, sometimes the adult kind of is, is so forgiving in their uh, way that they interact with someone that they don't recognize that that child's having some challenges in those areas. Um, so uh, at times it may seem like a child is not responding uh, to something and it may just be that they have an inordinately long processing time or a different processing uh, process for that information and it may take them some time to recognize. Some kids, uh, um, you may notice in a classroom, if an instruction is given, uh, they won't immediately start to do what the instruction is. Um, but a lot of these kids end up um, developing their own accommodations, their own um, uh, coping skills. And some of those coping skills often are to observe what's going on around them. So they may not, you know, an instruction is given, they may you know, take something out of your desk and write your name at the top of a piece of paper. They may not start doing that until they observe that, uh, look around the room and see that others are doing that, and then they start doing that. Um, and then finally, this, uh, uh, this characteristic that uh, when we as adults are trying to help these kids, they often do things that we view as sabotaging those efforts. They, they do things, you know, when we help, they end up acting in a way that we um, would not think is, is rational or um, responsible in those areas. And that's really tied to the way that they think and the way that they, they some really intense needs they have and a, a more um, advanced or intense need for control. And uh, we're going to talk about that in a, a few slides later. So uh, next slide, Anna. Great. Thank you. So if we're looking at the medical model around mental health care, these are some areas that will come up um, very frequently. So first we can look at psychiatry. And so when we're talking about psychiatry, we're really talking about um, medical doctors that can provide a diagnosis, can provide a treatment plan, and then can also prescribe medications. And so when we're talking about that, we're really talking about psychiatrists. Um, we also talk about psychotherapy and that is um, performed sometimes by a psychologist, but it can also be a, a counselor, a therapist, and that's really uh, a way to treat mental health by using talk therapy, um, and there can be different folks. I think, too, in our schools, a lot of times, it, it's not psychotherapy, but you can have some of that talk therapy um, utilized by social workers within that school. So it's slightly different. And then last, we also talk about neuropsychiatry. And so that's a different branch. And that's really focused on looking at how mental illness is going to affect a child or youth's ability to learn or behave. And so in the school setting and, and the medical model, we would many times we talk about having a child undergo a neuropsychological evaluation. And that's looking very broadly at what are all the different aspects that their mental illness impacts. So how they take information, how they process it, how they're able to react to situations, their social emotional development. So 
it's a pretty broad look at how mental illness impacts that child or youth. And really, in, in, in the school setting, ideally a child has access to that type of evaluation, so you can really have a full understanding of how that child is impacted. Hugh, did you want to add anything? Uh, no. Okay. The only other thing that I would add to this is, um, in my experience in the school setting, a lot of times, uh, many, many, all schools probably have a school psychologist, not all schools, but many schools do. And I, one thing I would just say, in the setting of like the educational landscape, school psychologists, a big part of their role is around um, diag uh, not diagnosing, but working on the evaluation process to see if uh, a student is eligible for special education services and looking at that. They, they won't have as much of a background in that talk therapy as other individuals do. You're up, Hugh. Right. Yep. Um, so we wanted to uh, provide you with some information on some of the uh, common types of therapy that uh, are used for kids with mental health needs. Um, this is by no means a uh, comprehensive list. It's actually a very, very small list. Um, but the things that are are probably um, either more common uh, today in our state uh, or are there's a growing body of either evidence or use of some of these uh, therapies. Uh, so the first is cognitive behavioral therapy. Often you hear that's uh, uh, referred to as CBT. You can read the definition there and you know you can use this slide if you're interested in any of these. You just just google those terms and you'll find tons of resources that um, uh, explain these different types of uh, uh, therapy modalities. Uh, dialectical behavior therapy or DBT um, is um, a, a, a therapy that is often used for people at risk of uh, suicide and is uh, very effective for um, uh, for people that have that kind of self-harm um, perspective. And it's, um, you know, at one point in time, there was a, a belief that people who are diagnosed with uh, borderline personality disorder are not treatable not the case, not a not a viewpoint that I, you know, I, I feel like almost everyone is treatable, uh, but DBT has been found to be effective with people who are diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Um, acceptance, acceptance and commitment therapy, um, uh, it, even though it says kids in there, it's actually used for adults as well. So I just want to clarify that. And it's really a way to process your inner emotions and to move forward in a positive way. Um, and then I, I included a couple here that are used uh, with anxiety and or um, uh, PTSD, which is an anxiety type disorder. Um, exposure therapy, which is one where someone with uh, significant anxiety is exposed to those things that trigger their anxiety. Um, and in a safe manner and uh, helps, um, helps them overcome the anxiety that's associated with those triggers. And then EMDR, uh, which uh, stands for Eye Movement Desensit Desensitization and Reprocessing. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there, th this is a, a, a newer kind of uh, therapy that I think the initial um, studies on it. It was developed in, in the very late 80s, um, or early 90s. And, um, you know, there were some people that kind of thought it was uh, snake oil. How, how can you do something that involves moving your eyes and that's going to help you deal with these uh, traumatic uh, uh, thoughts and memories? I, I will tell you, however, that there have been some very reputable studies that it showed that EMDR is uh, equally or more effective than CBT in dealing with certain anxiety disorders. Um, and I just recently uh, spoke with a mom whose uh, adult daughter um, had such anxiety that she was hospitalized and uh, went through uh, uh, EMDR 
and um, has not had a recurrence of anxiety for four years now. So, um, you know, I'm not saying it's a, a cure-all, but I'm, I'm saying that even though it sounds a little uh, iffy, uh, there are some people who have had some really uh, uh, great responses to EMDR. Um, that being said, there's not, uh, you know, there are people that for which these therapies are effective, and there are people for which these therapies are not effective. So it's very individualized, but there are multiple things to try if one of these doesn't work for you or your child personally. Um, I did add a couple of things on here that are not recommended. I guess I should have said that Wisconsin Family Ties doesn't recommend these. Um, and both of these are widely used in our state. Uh, one is PCIT, Parent-Child Interaction Therapy. The other is a and uh, we believe in there's a growing body of evidence as well as a growing uh, voice of people who have gone through these therapies uh, saying that they find the practice or parts of the practice coercive. And uh, so we think there are other more compassionate, um, humane therapies out there, including the ones listed above that, uh, that line, uh, that are preferable uh, to those two modalities. Next slide. Thanks, you. So next, I just wanted to take a few minutes just to talk about some school-based mental health supports that may be available in your area. And I, I am going to focus on, on what we have in the Med Madison Metropolitan School District because I'm most familiar uh, with our district. But these are certainly things um, that are evidence-based and could be utilized in other districts across the state. So, you know, one thing that our district has invested in is really helping with service navigation, because what we hear from a lot of families is that it's very hard to figure out how to access services within the community, and it takes a lot of understanding of how systems work. So in our school district, um, we do have um, behavioral health navigation, so we have two folks on staff that can help families that are looking to connect with mental health services in the community. They can reach out and they can work with them to get connected. Um, the district also invested in something called Care Solus, and that is really um, a organization that can help families just go in, enter their child's information, enter their healthcare information, and then it will help them get connected to specific providers. And it's actually really nice too, because it, it lets you know, is that provider taking um, individuals on at that time? And so all these green ones have links to the, the different um, organizations or programs. And then also in our district, we do have a number of behavioral health interventions. They tend to be in groups and they are led by um, a professional. And so we have something called CBITS. I believe it's Cognitive Behavioral Intervention for Trauma. I, I don't know exactly, but if you click on it, you'd be able to see what the acronym stands for. Bounce Back is another free program um, that works for uh, kids that may be impacted by depression or anxiety. We utilize motivational interviewing. And then for our younger learners, so CBITS and Bounce Back are really for um, kids a little bit older, 12 and up. Face Kids are, is for our younger students. And again, those are small group interventions where um, kids are working with a, a facilitator to better understand um, their emotions, self-regulation, and different coping skills. Um, also in our district, we have a variety of peer group interventions. So those are group interventions that are really more peer-led. There is some adult facilitation, but really the, the group content is driven by the, the peer leadership within that group. And then also for our students that really have the highest level of mental health needs, we have a couple of programs. One is called Building Bridges, and that's really a 90-day program where school staff works with families, works with teachers to really figure out what those unmet mental health needs are, work with the teachers and the families to better address those needs and work to get um, those families connected to community resources. And then we also have something called behavioral health in schools, and that's really a partnership um, with a health care provider 
where some students are receiving that one-on-one -on -one, uh, therapy within the school setting to kind of remove some of those barriers, whether that may be lack of access to insurance, transportation, um, or economic uh, status. And so those are some of the things that we use for students. And then something else our district has created over the years is something called the intensive support team. And so that's a team of individuals that go in and work directly with the school staff, not the students, not the families, but really with the school staff to better understand the underlying mental health needs of that child and better ways to help that child deal with that and then also work with the teachers to build their capacity. So those are some of the things that we provide within our school district. Like I said, this many of these approaches are national approaches, so they would be available to other districts. And the reason I want to share them is because I know that at the national level and at the state level, there's a considerable amount of money that is being directed and, and invested in mental health care for our children and youth. So just being aware of what's out there, I think is really important. Hugh, did you want to add anything else? Nope. Great. So on the flip side, what might be available within your community to address um, your child's mental health needs? And I think what's really important to understand is that although we see that the data shows that, that not a high number of kids are getting that health care in the community, they should be. And here are some options that you might have within your community. And so first, what I included is a link to Comprehensive Community Services. Um, it is fairly new, correct, you in our state? I feel like we're eight years in, maybe? Uh, it's, it's actually been around, uh, I think, longer than that. But it's uh, the change was about eight years ago where the state, it's a Medicaid benefit, and the state picked up the uh, non-federal portion of the cost. Before that, counties used to have to uh, um, fund that themselves through yes. tax levy or whatever. And so about eight years ago, it um, that, that change was made. And because of that, it's really expanded throughout the state. Yes, thanks you, that's correct. And so with CCS, I think the important thing for families to know is that your child or youth does have to be Medicaid eligible and they do need to have a mental health diagnosis, although that diagnosis could be coming from a primary care physician as well as a psychologist, psychiatrist. Um, another program here in Dane County, we have a program called Children Come First, or CCF, and that's really a higher level of support. It's what we would consider wraparound support. So that would really be for children or youth that have more intensive uh, mental health needs. In Milwaukee County, it's called Wraparound Milwaukee, similar program, and, and, and I'm not as familiar, Hugh, you can weigh, on, weigh in on this, but we also have something called coordinated service teams. And so that would be that wraparound approach in other counties in Wisconsin. Uh, yes, that's exactly right. Coordinated services teams, or CST, is the wraparound approach in other counties. Um, and it is designed not only for mental health, kids with mental health uh, needs, but any child who is involved in two or more systems of care. So a system of care can be mental health and special education, child welfare, youth justice, any of those systems. Um, and, and I would add one other onto this list, uh, Anna, which mm -hmm. is the Children's Long-Term Support Waiver uh, uh, is also available um, across the state for kids with mental health needs. Thanks, Hugh. I don't know why I left that one off. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes, CLTS, and we hear a lot about that. <laughs> All right, so now we kind of dug in deep into kind of the medical stuff. So let's bring it out a little bit more broadly to what you can do more generally. So Hugh, go ahead. Yeah, so, um, you know, my personal opinion is that uh, often our kids with mental health needs are misunderstood. Um, and really, we as adults, one of the things that we can do uh, most to help these kids is to try to better understand them. And so this slide talks about some of the things that these kids 
uh, need. Um, and while I think all kids need these kinds of things, uh, it's just the way that our kids experience these that makes it a little more uh, problematic. So the first one is success and control. Um, you know, all kids, again, need to feel successful. They need to have, an, uh, you know, all adults as well. We need to feel an element of control. Um, however, our kids, um, you know, most kids today, uh, or any time really, they will, um, when it comes to success, they realize that if they fail at something that they need to try a different way. You know, it's the old uh, adage, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Uh, but our kids seem to be missing that. And so um, to, to them, failure is final. And so you, um, it's better from their perspective to not try at all if there's a if they believe that they may fail rather than to try and possibly fail so they they experience this they have this need this intense need for immediate and complete success a complete in their mind uh, likewise and and very um, closely tied to this uh, idea of success is their need for control. Um, and so that uh, it is, again, they experience this in a very intense way, and they don't have all of the skills to kind of, um, uh, to be able to cope with situations where they're not uh, feeling like they're in control. Um, some things like negotiation skills, they don't have a, a advanced or even age appropriate negotiation skills. Most kids start to learn those kinds of things innately and our kids tend not to. Um, this idea of them needing control, uh, if you recall from a few slides back, uh, we said that the kids often sabotage uh, efforts to help them and that's really closely tied to their need for control. And so when we help some of these kids, um, they view that as, you know, if I accept this help, there's an unknown outcome. I don't know what that outcome is going to be. However, I'm fully aware of what the outcome is if I um, act in a way or behave in a way that's going to get me in trouble because I know that those, that's something I can count on, right? I know that if I talk back to the teacher, uh, I'm going to be sent to the office or if I um, you know, throw something, I am going to be suspended. And to, to them, in a weird way, that provides more comfort for them knowing an outcome than um, going into something that's the unknown. And so they, they often act in a way that they don't expect because they are trying to uh, um, produce this known outcome for themselves. So the way that we have to get around that, the only way I know to get around that is for us as adults to act in unexpected ways so that when they do those, when they act in those ways, when they behave badly in our minds, uh, that we don't use the same consequences that we always have because we have to break that pattern for them. Uh, other strategies for dealing with success and control is to foreshadow as much as possible. Uh, let students know ahead of time uh, what the plan is. Um, let them know if there are alternatives that uh, could happen based on certain conditions. We um, had a situation once where uh, a, a student ended up, uh, it was gym class. They were supposed to in gym class. Uh, the teacher had told them, next time we're going to play flag football. Um, uh, go outside and play flag football. They uh, got to that next gym class. It's raining cats and dogs. So they're not going outside to play flag football. Well, this kid was, that's what, there was no alternative. That's what was going to happen. And long story short, it, it came, uh, it, it continued to escalate to the point where um, a crisis team was called, the kid was taken down and restrained, and it, it was it was a mess. Um, and so, you know, in that situation, uh, it, it's not always intuitive because, you know, we think that most students would realize that, hey, if the weather's bad, we're going to have to do something else. But for some students, being able to recognize that they need that in order to, to plan and make sure that they're going to stay regulated, uh, that, um, hey, if, it's, if the weather doesn't allow, which means that it's raining or snowing or if it's too windy or whatever, 
we're going to have to do something different. We're not going to be able to play flag football. Um, uh, also, uh, the other uh, another thing that's really important is to be able to make sure that they're successful is to pre-teach. Make sure that we know that that the student knows how to do what those things are that we ask uh, him or her to do, uh, that they uh, can accomplish those. And so uh, using foreshadowing and pre-teaching are things that are really important. Uh, the others, uh, you know, we'll uh, touch on a little bit later because uh, we're running out of time, so I'm not going to go into those in detail. If anybody has any questions about those, they can uh, email me and I'd be happy to, to talk to you about those. But uh, these are the areas where we think that kids do need, um, our, our kids need a little bit of extra help. So next slide, Anna. So, um, you know, often we think that uh, effective practice uh, in as an educator or really with any in any line of work uh, is a combination of skills and experience. But when it comes to dealing with other human beings, I think that there are uh, other pieces that are uh, more important, and those include our beliefs and our attitudes, which influence how we act. And so those are um, the things that I think we need to spend more time focusing on. So let's go to the next slide, Anna. I think you've got the uh, first few. Huh? Yep, I'm gonna do the first few and then I'll hand it off to you, Hugh. So just some really important key beliefs for supporting kids with mental health needs. First of all, and foremost, is we always like to talk about kids do well if they can, not if they want to. And unfortunately, in our school system, we really have a system that's set up on kids do well based on the beliefs kids do well if they want to. And that's where we get into this cycle of punishments and rewards to try to increase behaviors we find acceptable or get rid of behaviors that we don't find acceptable. But really, we should be looking at kids do well if they can. So if they're not doing well, that lets us know that there is an underlying skills deficit that we need to be helping that child learn, or there might be some unmet needs that need to be filled for that child. And so really, if you look at it from the vantage point of kids do well if they can, it's much more empowering for teachers and families, because then you're really in the role that there is something you can do, there's something that you can teach. You're not just stuck in that moment. Also, another big thing we hear a lot about, especially for our kids with mental health needs, is there's this issue of non-compliance. Kids that don't listen, don't do what they're told to, don't follow through. And really, when we think of compliance, that really leads to a high level of vulner vulnerability, I can't even say it, in our children and youth. And it can be really unsafe for them in the short term as well as the long term. We don't want compliant kids. We want kids that can problem solve, that can collaborate, that can uh, think independently. And if we're focused solely on compliance, it really, like I said, puts our kids in an unsafe position. And then another thing is fair does not mean equal. Again, this is something that we hear that, and we're moving away from it. I think there is a shift, but many times it's, why should I do this for this kid if this kid doesn't need it? We always have to remember every person is an individual. They're going to have very different needs and treating them all the same does not mean that that's fair. All right. We really need to make that shift to an equity based model. All right. All right. So uh, the next uh, the ability to recite rules is not the same as the ability to understand and apply the rules. I mean, we do this as adults, right? Um, you know, often what we'll hear is, well, he knows what he should do. Well, that um, doesn't apply to our lives either. I mean, I know what the speed limit is. I don't always go the speed limit. And uh, you know, I, in driving, uh, I, I live an hour away from my office. And so from dri driving into work, I can tell you that a lot of other people are ignoring that speed limit as well. So. Um, Again, uh, just knowing the rules is not necessarily the same as the ability to apply those rules, and so our kids don't always do that. 
Um, and also just because, uh, you know, often I'll hear, well, he did it last time or she did it last time. Um, all of us have different things that we perform better than others. And uh, we're not the same every single day. And so trying to recognize that the same thing happens with kids. Some days they have good days, some days they have bad days, just like we do as adults. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if everybody performed the same every single day uh, based on their capability, we would have no, uh, um, no need for individual athletic competitions like track and field. We would already know who was the fastest person out there, but the fastest person doesn't uh, on any given day doesn't always win. Uh, and then finally, that the socially appropriate behavior must be taught. Uh, we're really good at teaching things like reading and math and things like that. But when it comes to those kinds of socially acceptable ways of interacting with people or um, acting in groups, um, we tend to just be more punitive in our approaches when they don't, when kids don't do what we want them to do rather than using those same kinds of strategies that we've developed and have been researched extensively in how to teach when it comes to behavior. And so we can apply those same kinds of techniques uh, where we um, uh, give kids alternate ideas as to how to uh, do something and give them opportunities to practice, allow them to fail, and then uh, also uh, continue to work with them until they learn new ways of dealing with that. In the next slide, I, we're running out of time, so I will just leave it up there. Hugh, did you want to add anything? Um, I, I would say that there's uh, just, just a couple of things I would uh, put into this. Um, the only person whose behavior you can control is your own. Uh, that comes from uh, Dr. William uh, Glasser's choice theory. And so if you just look up choice theory, you can find out, and I firmly believe that. So we often try to control kids' behaviors when it's really us. We need to change as, as adults. If we do something differently, we can help produce different outcomes for kids. Uh, and the other one that I would say is this, because it's not clear, is this uh, rule of reciprocation. And that's really, um, so, so have you ever received in the mail uh, a request to do a survey and it comes with a dollar bill? Well, there's science behind that. It's because people feel the, uh, more compelled to respond to those if they're if they were given something, and there's science behind that as well. And so, if we act, you know, oftentimes what I've heard is as adults say, "Well, the kid has to give me something first. You know, has to act in a particular way." Mm, the exact opposite really is in play when you look at the science behind it. And it's us, um, we're probably in a much better position to be able to give something to that kid. And if we do that, then we get it back. If we give respect, then we will give get respect in return, more likely to get respect in return. So um, I'm glad a little timer went off there because it gives me a chance to <laughs> interject at this point. Um, we have 12.59 and we can continue for five more minutes if that is what the two of you would like at this time because we do have a couple of statements and questions that I'd like to touch on. But do you want to go further now or are we close to your end? This is very close to the end. Yes. So. Um, I just I, I know this is a quote and I think it's just really being mindful that if something's not working to keep trying and just keep exploring as the adult, what else can you try? And that there really is there is always something else to just keep trying uh, to help that child and better understand them. Hugh, did you want to add anything? Nope. Yep. And then the last thing and Hugh really talked about this with the other slide too that your relationship with a child or youth is really the key intervention. If you can develop that relationship and have that reciprocity, it will go farther than any type of specialized evidence-based practice that you might find out there. It, the key is really a relationship and it's critical as a protective factor for our children and youth, especially those impacted by trauma. Hugh? Yeah, and so finally, I just put this up. I think that uh, um, you know, oftentimes as parents, we feel like uh, 
uh, we don't have others who have kind of been in our shoes. And there is uh, parent peer support. Wisconsin Family Ties is one of the organizations that is that's our whole organization is dedicated to this. And um, these are the kinds of things that parent peer support can help uh, provide for, for parents. Excellent. And that's uh, that's it, Bonnie. Okay, thank you both. Um, I do have just a couple of comments. Um, some people had a difficult time trying to download the uh, handout. So if you had that problem, please contact me via email and I'll send you the handout um, personally after the uh, today's live presentation. I do have a, a question or two for the two of you, if you don't mind. One mm -hmm. um, was relating to, um, having therapy in the schools. And um, the comment in question was oftentimes school districts prevent therapists from coming in the schools. Like some school districts are much better than others in doing that. This person evidently lives in a district that they prevent mm -hmm. that from happening. So how do we work with a school district to encourage them that this might be a good idea? Hugh, why don't you start? Uh, well, my first thought is to get something into your IEP that uh, um, talks about that service. So uh, it, it can be a supplemental service in my mind, and uh, certainly um, something if that's if that's something that is needed for educationally for the student, um, then I think you have a pretty good pretty good case for it. That you know, that would be my first step. Yeah, and Bonnie, this has come up quite a bit too. I hear this from families as well, especially in regard to therapy for kids that may be on the autism spectrum. I see it more so with, you know, as far as I know, via DPI, there is no restriction on whether therapists are coming into school. That has been changed in the past, there was. But yes, I agree. I think it can vary from district to district. So what I, I think going the IEP route is a good route. I always encourage families too, if districts are saying there's a policy in place, then I would ask the district where that policy is written. And just to know that policies are implemented by the Board of Education. So you'd really be looking at a board policy um, stating that. So kind of it, digging a little bit more into that comment. Okay, thank you. And then another quick one. This person was interested in knowing why um, you felt that ABA was not a good behavior therapy to take a look at. Yeah, I know that's really controversial and it's widely used, particularly in the autism community. Um, I have a son on the autism spectrum. When he was little, we went through ABA. And I, I think that that's... Um, that uh, opinion has been kind of slow in forming over many, many years, um, and particularly as, as the uh, adult uh, autistic community has become um, much more vocal in what things worked for them and what things didn't. And there's a, a pretty uh, strong um, uh, Pretty strong evidence that the that ABA is uh, has not been helpful and in some cases is actually harmful for kids uh, in terms of being uh, coercive. Uh, particularly if you look at a, a lot of the discrete trials are hand over hand. They don't really it doesn't really teach generalization that is necessary for kids to kind of navigate the world. And the adult autistic community is pretty adamant that, uh, you know, the, the world needs to kind of accommodate them or adapt to them rather than, uh, you know, forcing them to act in a way that is uncomfortable or even um, difficult for them. So, you know, I think it's, uh, that's really kind of the, the basis for it is that it's, um, it's a little more coercive. And there's a growing number of uh, researchers and psychologists who are now expressing those same kinds of, of thoughts. And uh, they, they have a pretty strong argument from our perspective. 
Well, thank you both. Um, it's now 105 and we will need to um, end our webinar for today. Anna, you, do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share at this time? Uh, you know, just thanking people for being, you know, part of this webinar. And, and I just know as a parent, some, something that I encourage people to do is, especially in the area around mental health, is to really be proactive because um, you just want to know what supports are out there. So be prepared because things can change quite dra dramatically. And you just, it's better to be proactive than reactive. Yes, I'll echo that and uh, um, you know thanks to everyone who attended we hope you found something that was helpful uh, and you know if you disagree with the ABA or the PCIT thoughts I, I just put those out there as uh, things that we believe in uh, but you know we, we don't uh, disparage anyone who feels differently and and uh, wants to partake in those in fact many of the families that we serve are continuing to use those those kinds of therapies um, and uh, thanks again, and sorry that we uh, went over your time with it. Well, we appreciate it from both of you today. Thank you so very much. I'm sure that I learned a lot, and I know that those that participated did as, as well. So thank you both. Um, this will conclude our webinar today. Thank you for joining us. Please be reminded that Wisconsin Facets has over 100 scheduled trainings and workshops for the year 2022 and now for the year 2023. Please check out our website calendar and register for any of those upcoming trainings that may be of interest to you. And also, please watch for the short evaluation that will be coming your way after today's live presentation. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. And again, thank you, Anna and you. Bye now. Thank you.